Welcome. This will be the mini lecture for nucleophilic addition to ketones and aldehydes. The carbonyl structural unit is the key component of the ketone and aldehyde functional group. So we have two parts to that carbonyl structural unit. The first is the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. Now, the carbonyl structural unit is found in a wide range of functional groups, aldehydes and ketones, which will be the focus of this video lecture, but also carboxylic acids, acid chlorides, esters, amides, and anhydrides, which we will uh, examine in future videos. So we really want to focus our attention on aldehydes and ketones and understand what governs their reactivity. So a little bit about the carbonyl's properties. One of the things that we can see right away is that the carbonyl is a polarized bond. Um, it is polarized from the carbon to the oxygen, as we can see here, which means that the carbon has a partial positive charge and the oxygen has a partial negative charge. In addition to that, uh, that carbon-oxygen pi bond allows us to draw uh, another resonance form in it, in a charge-separated form, where that carbonyl carbon can take a formal positive charge and the carbonyl oxygen can take a formal negative charge. So the similarities um, that we're going to see across all the functional groups that have a carbonyl structural unit is that the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic, right? Based on both bond polarity and resonance, we can determine that that carbon will be an electrophile and it will want to react with nucleophiles. The other thing that we will see being a similarity across these different functional groups is that the carbonyl oxygen is a Lewis base. It can be either protonated or it can coordinate to a Lewis acid. The differences among the different functional groups that have a carbonyl carbon depend on what these Y and Z groups um, that are attached to the carbonyl carbon will be. These two groups have the ability to significantly affect the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon, and that's going to change how reactive the different derivatives are with various nucleophiles and what their mode of reactivity will be. In addition, if either Y or Z, or potentially both, are leaving groups or could be leaving groups, that's going to affect the outcome of the reaction. It'll affect the mechanism and the product is formed, and the product that's formed. So these are all things that we're going to want to remember as we move forward and examine the wide range of functional groups that contain the carbonyl carbon. So <clears throat> in terms of the different reactions that uh, functional groups with a carbonyl structural unit uh, can undergo, aldehydes and ketones will undergo two different types of reactions. The first is nucleophilic addition, where the nucleophile is what we're going to call a good base. We'll see that that's a very generous term for certain examples, uh, but that's a beginning way for us to classify and to recognize the type of reactivity that they will engage in. And those good bases are, for example, hydride, carbon anions, nitriles, which are, or cyanide, which is another carbon anion, and water type nucleophiles. Additionally, aldehydes and ketones can undergo a type of reaction called nucleophilic addition elimination. And that's where the nucleophile will have what I'm going to term an extra lone pair on it. Um, and these are situations such as when the nucleophile is an amine or is an alcohol. The remaining uh, functional groups that contain the carbonyl, uh, we classify these broadly as carboxylic acid derivatives, and these undergo a type of reactivity called nucleophilic acyl substitution. 
So for the remainder of this lecture, we're going to focus on nucleophilic addition type reactions of aldehydes and ketones. And so we're going to examine this reactivity with each of the four types of nucleophiles shown here, hydrides, carbon anions, nitriles, and water type nucleophiles. So before we dig into these actual reactions, we want to spend just an extra moment or two talking about some of the similarities and differences between aldehydes and ketones. So the similarities is that on aldehydes and ketones, there is no leaving group attached to the carbonyl carbon. Remember that <clears throat> uh, alkyl groups and hydrogen are not leaving groups because the carbanion will have a conjugate acid pKa somewhere between you know, 25, 45, or 60, depending on the hybridization of the carbon that's going to have the lone pair and the negative charge. And the conjugate acid of a hydride will be hydrogen gas, which has a pKa of approximately 36. So since the conjugate acids of these potential leaving groups um, are so high, they're such very weak conjugate acids, neither the alkyl nor the hydride are going to be a leaving group, and so that is going to be the similarity between those two. Now, in terms of differences, in terms of the differences <clears throat> between aldehydes and ketones, the first major difference is going to be the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon. So, one of the things that we've seen in organic chemistry is that alkyl groups are more electron donating than hydrogen groups. And so because of that, we have two alkyl groups on the ketone, whereas we only have one alkyl group on the aldehyde. That means both of the alkyl groups on the ketone are donating electron density to the ketone's carbonyl carbon. That increased electron density on the ketone's carbonyl carbon is going to mean it is less electrophilic than the aldehyde's carbonyl carbon. Also, if we think in terms of sterics, the size of the groups attached to the carbonyl carbon, the Alkyl group is bigger than a hydrogen. Any alkyl group will be bigger than a hydrogen. And so we have, again, two much larger groups surrounding the ketone carbonyl carbon versus the aldehyde carbonyl carbon, which means that the electrophilic atom in a ketone is less accessible. It is more sterically hindered than the electrophilic atom on an aldehyde. So for both these electronic and steric reasons, we see that our aldehydes are actually going to be more reactive than a ketone. So aldehydes are going to be more reactive than ketones for both electronic reasons, the carbonyl carbon of an aldehyde is more electrophilic, and for steric reasons, the carbonyl carbon of an aldehyde has easy or is more easily accessed by a nucleophile. Okay, so <clears throat> as we've mentioned, this mini lecture is going to be all about nucleophilic addition type reactions when the nucleophile is what we're going to generously call, uh, for certain examples, a good base. So <clears throat> regardless of whether you have an aldehyde or a ketone, nucleophilic addition reactions have a mechanism that will have commonality regardless, uh, certain commonalities, excuse me, regardless of the actual nucleophile that we're using or the electrophile that we're using. And we can go through this step by step. We start off with our nucleophile and our uh, aldehyde or ketone. The nucleophile uses its lone pair, forms a bond to that electrophilic carbon that carbon-oxygen pi bond breaks, which forms a new lone pair on the carbonyl oxygen, which gives us our first intermediate, which we call a tetrahedral intermediate. Now, in all of the reactions that involve a carbonyl carbon 
and a nucleophile reacting together, we will always form a tetrahedral intermediate. So this tetrahedral intermediate is going to come back again when we talk about nucleophilic addition and elimination reactions, and it's going to come back again when we look at nucleophilic acyl substitution. So we want to get a sense for recognizing this tetrahedral intermediate and knowing that it is a uh, key uh, part of all of the mechanisms for reactions of carbonyl with nucleophiles. In general, that tetrahedral intermediate in nucleophilic addition type reactions then becomes protonated from some proton, proton source. Typically, this is a mild acid like H3O plus or a pyridinium or ammonium type uh, proton source, right? Lots of potential proton source, but it's going to be a very mild acid that usually protonates our tetrahedral intermediate to ultimately give our final product, right, where the nucleophile has added to the carbonyl carbon and as opposed to a sp2 hybridized oxygen, we now have an sp3 hybridized oxygen that is in the alcohol form. And again, just want to highlight this tetrahedral intermediate is going to be central and key to all of the mechanisms that involve both a nucleophile and a carbonyl. So why don't we go ahead and take and pause our video here and take some time to complete model one of the worksheet. Model one should help you to review the topics and concepts that are just presented. And once you've completed model one, go ahead and continue forward with the video. So now that we have a sense for the reactivity of ketones and aldehydes and what controls that, we want to go ahead and take a look at the individual reactions that fall under the category of nucleophilic addition. And the first type of nucleophile that we're going to look at is the hydride nucleophile, a, hydride, a hydrogen atom with a lone pair and a negative charge. Now, these types of nucleophiles typically come from reagents like lithium aluminum hydride, which is a very powerful reducing agent that is rarely used with ketones and aldehydes, little too strong and more than what is necessary, or something like sodium borohydride, which is very commonly used with ketones and aldehydes. It is a milder reducing agent and uh, fits very nicely with the ketones and aldehydes. Um, so we'll see again when we look at reduction of other uh, carbonyl functional groups, um, the use of a lithium aluminum hydride. But for now, we're going to stick to sodium borohydride, and it is one of these hydrogen atoms bonded to the boron that is going to serve as the actual nucleophile. And here we can see the mechanism of the reaction. So once again, our nucleophile forms a bond to our carbonyl carbon. The carbon-oxygen pi bond breaks. That generates our tetrahedral intermediate, and we protonate our tetrahedral intermediate from some sort of mild acid to give our final product. And depending on what we start, what our starting carbonyl compound is, we can generate typically one of two types of products. If we begin from an aldehyde, our product will be a primary alcohol. And if we begin from a ketone, our product will be a secondary alcohol. Now, there are multiple types of what we're going to consider carbanion type nucleophiles, and there's significant similarity between some of their mechanisms and differences as well. So all of our carbanion type nucleophiles are going to have a carbon atom with a negative charge on it and a lone pair. And the first type are going, that we're going to look at are going to be our Grignard reagents and organolithiums. Now remember that while Grignard reagents and organolithiums are drawn often with a covalent type bond between the metal atom and the carbon atom, we want to remember that they react as if they were an ionic pair, right, where the carbon atom has a lone pair and a negative charge and the metal atom will have a positive charge. Here, similarly, again, that R group, that alkyl group, that carbon-based group will be our nucleophile. That pair of electrons 
will go to make a bond to our carbonyl carbon. The carbon oxygen pi bond will break to put a lone pair onto the carbonyl oxygen, generating our tetrahedral intermediate. Tetrahedral intermediate gets protonated from some proton source to ultimately generate our final product. And again, depending on what our starting carbonyl was, will tell us the identity of our final product. If we begin from formaldehyde, we'll generate a primary alcohol where we have increased the length of that uh, alkyl chain from the Grignard by one carbon. Um, if we begin from an, any other aldehyde, we'll generate a secondary alcohol. And if we begin from a ketone, we will generate a tertiary alcohol. The second type of carbon nucleophile or carbanion nucleophile we're going to look at is going to be the acetylide. So recall back to when we talked about uh, alkynes, we saw that when terminal alkynes were treated with a strong base like sodium amide, right, we would generate a sodium acetylide or a negatively charged sp carbon. So we call these acetylide anions, and in this case, we have sodium acetylide. And we remember, we should recall that these are, these sodium acetylides or these acetylide anions are good nucleophiles. So here again, right, this, nucle this negatively charged sp carbon with its lone pair can use that lone pair, create a bond to our carbonyl carbon. That carbon oxygen pi bond will break and generate a new lone pair on our carbonyl oxygen. That gives us our tetrahedral intermediate, which is protonated by mild acid to eventually give us our final product, which once again is an alcohol. And if we use formaldehyde, that'll give us a primary alcohol. Any other aldehyde will give us a secondary alcohol. And if we use a ketone, it'll generate a tertiary alcohol. The final type of carbanion nucleophile we're going to look at is going to be the cyanide or nitrile nucleophile. Most commonly, this is going to be uh, introduced as a metal cyanide with sodium cyanide and potassium cyanide being common. Now, while the cyanide anion is a good nucleophile, when we use this reaction, uh, or we use this reagent uh, to add to a carbonyl, we definitely want to be using it in excess, and we want to use some HCl or other acid to help uh, drive this reaction forward. So the first thing that we want to keep in mind is that when we have our metal and our, our metal salt and our acid, our cyanide salt and acid, there'll be an acid-base equilibrium that's generating some HCN, but because we are using the HCl in excess, we also always have cyanide anion present as well. So since cyanide is used in excess, there's always some in reaction along with the HCN that is going to be in equilibrium. So because we have that cyanide anion in reaction, and it is a pretty good nucleophile, it will attack into the carbonyl carbon. And again, our carbon oxygen pi bond will break, giving a lone pair to our carbonyl oxygen. This time, however, the carbonyl oxygen is protonated from the HCN, which will generate our final product and will regenerate cyanide anion, and this new cyanide anion can go on to act as a nucleophile. Our product in this case is going to be a cyanohydrin, and cyanohydrins can be pretty valuable intermediates in organic chemistry. Um, there's a lot of transformations of that nitrile functional group, which can be uh, exploited later on to introduce very interesting uh, functional groups and uh, very valuable sorts of motifs. Now, notice here that unlike in our previous reactions uh, that we've seen thus far, all of these reactions with, or all of the steps of this reaction involve reversible steps.
So these are all in equilibrium, which is another reason that we want to use our cyanide in excess. Here we are going to hopefully be exploiting Le Chatelier's principle to drive this reaction to produce as much product, as much cyanohydrin as possible. Okay, so here we're going to take our second pause in this video and go ahead and complete Model 2, both Part A and Part B of Model 2 of your worksheet. This again is just going to be a review to help you reinforce some of the concepts uh, that we've seen in this portion of the video. Once you've completed Model 2, Part A and Part B, go ahead and continue forward in the video. The final type of nucleophile that we're going to examine are what we're going to consider to be water type nucleophiles. Um, and even though water in and of itself isn't the actual nucleophile in one of these two examples, overall um, it is gener the nucleophiles are generated from water um, and water is added across the carbonyl. In the first uh, case in the first water type nucleophile case, we're going to be looking at addition of water to a carbonyl under basic conditions. And so our actual nucleophile in this case is going to be hydroxide, which is a good, in addition to being a good base, is also going to be a good nucleophile. Again, this is one of these situations where we are going to use our nucleophile in excess uh, to exploit Le Chatelier's principle and drive our equilibrium to produce as much product as possible. The mechanism for this reaction, hydroxide will act as a nucleophile using a lone pair to generate a bond to our carbonyl carbon. The carbon-oxygen pi bond will break. This will generate our tetrahedral intermediate, which will be protonated from water and that will give us our final product and will regenerate some hydroxide, right, that can go on to continue this process forward. In this case, this product of our reaction is what's called a hydrate. And generally speaking, hydrates are relatively unstable. In fact, there has to be one of two characteristics of the starting carbonyl compound for a hydrate to for its hydrate to be stable either one it should be formaldehyde or two it should have for r1 and r2 very good so r1 and or r2 should be very good electron withdrawing groups. That helps to stabilize the hydrate. Um, there's additional information on this in the reading, um, but that's what we should be aware of. Other than these two cases, with our starting carbonyl being formaldehyde or our starting carbonyl having very good electron withdrawing groups attached to the carbonyl carbon, the hydrate will be unstable and it's difficult to isolate um, and it it really doesn't uh, stick around for us to make it uh, excessively useful. The second scenario that we're going to take a look at is adding water under acidic conditions. So water is a weak nucleophile. Um, it doesn't have a charge on it. Um, it in and of itself is a good leaving group. So it's, it's, it's not the greatest nucleophile out there. And to help water, a weak nucleophile, react with a carbonyl, we need to add a little bit of acid as a catalyst. And so remember that when we have water plus a proton source, we'll be generating H3O plus in equilibrium, and that H3O plus is going to be the actual catalyst uh, for the reaction. So this mechanism is a little bit different, but we'll see again that it still has some of the same core features. In the first step of this reaction, the carbonyl oxygen will be protonated, will act as a base, and 
take a proton from H3O+. This generates a protonated carbonyl, which is a better electrophile. It is a much stronger, a much more potent electrophile. Because it's a better electrophile, our weak nucleophile water can now come in, form a bond to the carbonyl carbon, and our carbon-oxygen pi bond once again will break and put a lone pair onto our carbonyl oxygen. At this point, we have a tetrahedral-like intermediate, but we would consider this a protonated tetrahedral intermediate. So it's a little bit different than the one that we've seen in all the other mechanisms this, thus far. That protonated tetrahedral intermediate, water, which is in our reaction, can take away a proton, right, from there to give us our final product, which is once again a hydrate, and regenerating our catalytic H3O+. So overall, we can see that here, we really have two very similar steps. Nucleophile adding into our carbonyl, tetrahedral intermediate, in this case losing a proton, right? But we see this commonality uh, in the center of our mechanism. And once again, we see our product commonality a nucleophile has added to the carbonyl carbon, the carbon-oxygen pi bond is broken, the oxygen of the, the carbonyl oxygen is now at the alcohol oxidation state. So once again, this mechanism or this set of reaction conditions will once again produce a hydrate, um, which has the same features as what we were mentioning about hydrates when we were talking about uh, basic conditions just a moment ago. Now, this acid-catalyzed mechanism is really important for us. Um, all the mechanisms that we've seen so far are important, of course, but um, I want to draw special attention to this one because we will see this mechanism again very soon when we discuss acetals. Um, this beginning portion of the mechanism is the first, uh, this mechanism, excuse me, is the beginning portion of the mechanism for acetal formation, which is one of the reactions in nucleophilic addition and elimination, which will be the next uh, topic that we cover in our sequence. So make sure you're comfortable with this because it'll put you on a good footing for when we start our next topic. All right, um, at this point, that's going to be the last portion of this video lecture. You should go ahead and once again pause here, and at this point, you should be completing Model 3 of the worksheet to reinforce your understanding of the concepts covered in the last portion of this video. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to seeing you during our Zoom session.